This is CBC Here and Now. $470,000 and counting. We're live at St. Kevin's Parish in the Ghouls, the latest spot hit by the Chase the Ace craze. I knew right off the bat. I said, there's a life lost. A sad start to the summer as 16-year-old drowns in Flat Rock. Close call caught on camera. This driver has his day in court. While fire leaves families homeless, we hear from those displaced by the Froud Street fire. On the rebound, hot summer temperatures return tomorrow here in the east. A gorgeous day coming for the whole island. Some showers in Labrador. All the details coming up. Welcome to Here and Now. Uh, let's get straight to our top story. A 16-year-old boy is dead and a family is in mourning following a drowning at a popular swimming spot in Flat Rock last night. Well, yeah, that tragedy has the community wondering whether the death could have been prevented. Here now's Ryan Cook has more. The current was still tugging hard this morning as remnants of yesterday's frantic recovery remained. Dave McCarthy, who lives near the river, is still trying to come to grips with Tuesday's drowning. Uh, last night I heard the number of sirens going. I seen the fire truck going out the main road and I knew right out the bed. I said, there's a life lost. Rescue crews were unable to revive the 16-year-old boy. Lifeless, he was carried out along a trail over the falls and past a plaque. A plaque commemorating Chris Codner, who was swept under the current in 2002. Now, yesterday's death is the third that we know of in that spot since the 1990s. Behind me here is Fred Gamberg. He told his friends one day in 1995 that he was going swimming. He never came home. The musician is now memorialized in this mural. At the time of his death, his family pushed for warning signs to be placed along the river. But now, more than 20 years later, there are still no signs. Just another memorial plaque. Uh, it was a horrible loss to us and to Fred's fans and the alternative music community in St. John's. And I can only imagine what this family is thinking, that this life of this 16-year-old guy is now over. And I'm so sorry. And please, town of Flat Rock, please do what you can. Bring in some risk management people to look at the scenario and formally come up with good strategies that will save lives. David McCarthy remembers those tragedies well. He doesn't know if signs will stop people from swimming here, but he does agree that something has to be done. We just hope this is the last one, but we know it's not, it's not going to be. Until then, McCarthy hopes people will pay closer attention to water levels after a rainfall. Ryan Cook, CBC News, Flat Rock. Well, it's been more than a week since a fire tore through a housing complex in St. John's and government is still looking for permanent homes. Eight units were completely destroyed, leaving 20 people homeless. Now local groups are coming together to help and with more than just donations. Here and now's Avneet Dillon explains. For families without a kitchen, this was a welcome sight. The Royal Canadian Legion on Black Marsh Road served lunch to families displaced by last week's fire. It's just one of the many ways the community is stepping up to help victims. It was amazing, you know, because I thought, well, we're on Froud Avenue, no one cares about us, right? But I'm telling you, in saying it all, they all come together. A week after the fire, residents like Sharon Sims are still dealing with the aftermath. She lived in one of the units that was completely destroyed. They got social workers down to the centre for us to go talk to. I go down here whenever I'm feeling sad and I sit down and I cry and they listen and I come out and I say thank you for listening. The executive director of the Froud Avenue Community Centre says many residents are feeling the same way. They're still, you know, uh, feeling a bit of the pain of what they had to go through and stuff. So, uh, in saying that they would be in a bit of a shock. Sims is staying with family while she waits for NL Housing to find a permanent home for her. Very, very soon they'll have me some. As long as I'm with my sister, I'm quite happy, to be honest with you, because I know they're going to get me some, you know, and eventually I will. You know, and then I'll start all over again no matter how old I am. The housing minister told me this morning that a permanent home has been found for one of the displaced families. The others are staying in hotels or with family and friends. But in the meantime, the community is still coming together, thanks to places like the Legion. Avneet Dillon, CBC News, St. John's. Volunteers are searching a wooded area near the Fox Trap Access Road in CBS tonight for any sign of Courtney Lake. The 24-year-old was last seen a month ago 
and police believe she was murdered. No one has been arrested in connection with her disappearance, but volunteers have been conducting searches for Lake's body or any evidence that might help in the investigation. Volunteers met at the Fox Trap Access Road at 6 o'clock tonight and will search the area south towards Pasture Lane Road. The RNC is asking anyone who may have seen a black GMC pickup truck with a distinctive decal, a deer head, on the rear window to contact them. Lake was last seen getting into that truck in Mount Pearl just before 8 p.m. on June 7th. Well, it was a nail-biting dash cam video that went viral, capturing a driver dangerously speeding and forcing another vehicle to get out of the way to avoid a head-on crash. Well, today that driver was convicted and sentenced for dangerous driving. Here now is Glenn Payette explains. Seen more than 300,000 times, the video shows it all. The wet conditions, the near miss as one driver has to pull to the shoulder of the CBS highway to avoid a deadly crash. Roger Hendry was the offending driver. He told police he was doing 130 kilometers an hour. I would rather that I didn't have the video to post, but uh, I'm happy at the same time that I have it to post. Because otherwise I wouldn't be here. Back then, Newhook told CBC he never wanted to see the video again. He didn't give a victim impact statement and wasn't in court when Henry was sentenced today for dangerous driving. At about the same time the video was being taken, Henry's girlfriend was calling the police saying Henry was drunk and suicidal. Henry's lawyer, Ken Moyes, told the court that his client was in a period of crisis and going through a difficult time. Henry has a mental condition and was off his medication. Judge James Walsh said whatever Henry was going through, it didn't justify him getting behind the wheel and putting himself and others at risk. The police couldn't prove that Henry was drinking, and he denies having a drinking problem. But Walsh didn't buy it. Certainly you have a drinking problem when it comes to getting behind the wheel. You need to look at not even being a social drinker. In the end, Walsh sentenced Henry to three months house arrest, a year's probation, recommended he get counseling for alcohol abuse and anger management, and he's not allowed to drive for two years. Henry is considered a medium risk to reoffend. Henry has two convictions for drunk driving that go back to 2004 and a conviction for driving while prohibited. The host arrest means that he can keep his job at an auto body shop. Today, his boss spoke very highly of him. Glenn Payette, CBC News, St. John's. The victim of a violent assault got an apology today from one of the men who attacked him during a house party in Southlands last year. 24-year-old Robert Mills pleaded guilty to attacking the man with brass knuckles back in March of 2016. In provincial court today, Mills said he wants counseling for anger management and addiction. The Crown is pushing for a sentence of five to seven years in jail. The 21-year-old victim was also stabbed seven times, but Mills has not been linked to that attack. Four youths have also been charged. Mills will be back in court for sentencing later this month. Well, moving to Grand Falls, Windsor now, where a 22-year-old reportedly drove his SUV into an apartment building on Lincoln Road last night. Several people were seen exiting the vehicle before the driver took off. RCMP arrested the man outside his home a short time later and found his vehicle hidden in a wooded area near the Exploits River. No one was seriously injured in the crash. The driver is expected to appear in court in the fall on charges of impaired and dangerous driving, leaving an accident and obstructing justice. A former premier says an investigation into Muskrat Falls needs to happen, and it needs to happen now. Brian Peckford says in light of the big cost overruns and the 2013 report warning of these problems, there needs to be a forensic audit. He says if government waits until Muskrat Falls is built, the pressure will have subsided. The problems that have been exposed in this project demand some answers now because now that the iron is hot, I think now is the time to look for those answers. And coming up in about 18 minutes from now, more from Peter's conversation with former Premier Brian Peckford. Well, time for another installment in our COD Comeback series. Tonight's story is about automation, using technology to do things faster and cheaper than human workers ever could. Well, right here in St. John's, engineers are building a robot that could disrupt the crab processing business in a big way. But some are worried it could also disrupt their way of life. Here now, Zach Gowdy has the story. Crab processing today looks much the same as it always has. 
Workers on a line cut the valuable leg sections from the crab, one crab at a time. But soon it could look like this. Smart robots cutting the legs off in sections or individually. And the only humans required work on the machine, not the crab. This is a control panel here. In a lab at the Marine Institute, a crowd has gathered for a glimpse of the possibilities. The robots will then take the crab apart. Bob Verge is managing director of the Canadian Centre for Fisheries Innovation. It uses the research and development muscle of universities to tackle problems in the commercial fishing industry. Right now, the problem is crab. Our overall goal was to uh, extract the meat. Instead of sending uh, our crab out as sections uh, with the meat in the shell, we thought we could get, attract a higher price if we sold the meat instead. But for now, there's only one way to get meat out of a crab, by hand. It's hard and time-consuming work. Used to be done in Newfoundland and Labrador. Now it's done in China and other low-wage countries. We wanted to bring that meat extraction back here and produce a very high quality product and get more value out of our resource. The solution? Automation. The technology didn't exist, so a team of local engineers built it from scratch. Cameras see the crab on the conveyor belt and pass the information to the grabbing and cutting arms. The legs can be severed in sections or one at a time. The next step is another robot to remove the meat from the legs. Verge and his team are working on that too. It's an engineering marvel made right here. But when some people look at this machine, they don't see the future. They see the end. We asked eight crab processing companies to speak with us about automation. Seven said no. The owner of Quinlan Brothers plant in Beta Verde initially agreed to an interview, but when we arrived at the plant, he changed his mind. It was Quinlan Brothers actually who gave us our paycheck, you know, he gave us our Christmas, really. Jessie Broders worked at the plant for 23 years. She says the town wouldn't be here without the jobs it provides, a job she can't imagine a robot doing well. With the crab in particular, I mean, it has to be uh, done in a neat manner and, uh, you know, the quality is very important and I can't see a machine doing that exactly. The Quinlan Brothers plant was recently rebuilt after a devastating fire. It's shiny and new, bustling with two full shifts of workers. But what you don't see is many young people. The average age of a fish plant worker in this province is 55 years old. We can't replace those baby boomers with an equal number of young people. We just can't do it. They're not, the young people aren't there, there aren't as many of them. And the younger people who are available have many job options available to them because every industry is facing that same issue with baby boomers retiring. In Verge's reckoning, automation won't create a jobs crisis in fish processing. The crisis is already here, and automation could be a solution. If we are going to attract the young people we need, I think we need to create better jobs, not more jobs. We, we have to offer them a better deal. And already, I think, just demonstrating this technology to young people, they're very impressed with it. And they say, you know, this is pretty impressive stuff. I kind of like to do this. Fish plant workers as high-skilled technologists. Fewer jobs, but better jobs. It's one possible future. What's certain is that the fishery of the future won't look like the fishery of today. Zach Gowdy, CBC News, St. John's. Well, the deck of cards is dwindling, but the crowd and the jackpot is growing for Chase the Ace in the Goulds. Tonight could be the night someone wins big. We'll take you there live.
Welcome back to Here and Now, and time to bring in Carolyn, mm -hmm. who's uh, doing weather today, and uh, I'm sitting in Debbie's chair. It's all musical chairs today. Yes, you're like the boys of summer here tonight. <laughs> boys of summer! <laughs> will we have more summer? That's we the question. Will. and that's what everyone is talking about today, is how cold it is in St. John's, and really We've been spoiled. On, totally spoiled, but it's coming back. It's coming back, and we'll get to that in just a moment, but first I want to show you this awesome video from Placentia. This was sent in to us from Wanda Pittman, I believe it is. I think uh, we have a super there. This is Placentia Bay, Marachine Island. Just look at that fog rolling in. Like, rolling like fingers just yeah. reaching out to grab you. Yeah, a beautiful sight, but unfortunately that fog does tend to keep things cold and things uh, are gonna stay a little bit chilly for Placentia tomorrow, it looks like. So let's have a look at the forecast. So tonight it will remain cold because of those uh, northerly winds and we actually have a risk of frost tonight. A very small risk, but a risk nonetheless here uh, in the east, pretty much everywhere uh, east of Clarenville. So keep that in mind tonight if you have any uh, frost sensitive plants. Uh, now the temperatures, as I said, are rising again tomorrow. Thank goodness. And uh, looking ahead to the weekend because of course we all are. We do have some showers on the way for Saturday. So keep that in mind if you're making some plans for the weekend. So uh, tonight into tomorrow, things are looking pretty quiet on the island. Not much action there. The winds will be changing, which uh, which will warm things up tomorrow. There are some showers moving in uh, across Labrador and some thunder showers in much of Labrador tonight and really all throughout the day today. Apparently they were getting some uh, Pretty intense thunder showers in some places, so that risk continues this evening. Fairly clear on the island. Uh, looking ahead to tomorrow, it is going to be gorgeous on the island. You can see those southwesterly winds coming up, and they're going to keep things nice and warm and pretty clear. We're going to see sunshine almost everywhere on the island tomorrow, but Labrador, some showers there. So this is what we're going to wake up to here in St. John's. About 11 degrees to start the day with sunny skies. It'll get up to about 22 tomorrow and stay pretty warm in the evening. 19 degrees at around uh, 7 o'clock tomorrow night. Looking ahead to some of the temperatures tomorrow. Just look at this. It's just a beautiful day. Like I mentioned, Placentia looking a little bit chilly tomorrow. 12 degrees as the high there, 16 in Fairyland, but uh, nice 24 degrees in Bonavista tomorrow. And Central looking very warm as well, unless you're along the coast where it is a bit cooler. 26 degrees is the temperature for most of Central tomorrow. And similar story here on the West Coast. So temperatures in the mid 20s with lots of sunshine and great up along the Straits as well. Same Anthony, sunny skies and 24 degrees tomorrow. Not bad at all. Looking at the rest of Labrador, like I mentioned, there are some showers that will be uh, moving in for much of uh, Labrador. About five millimeters expected in Labrador City tomorrow, but at least the temperatures are still nice and warm. You're almost cracking the 20s in Lab City and even along the coast, it's pretty warm. 22 as the high in Makovic. So as I mentioned, it looks like there are some showers on the way uh, for this Saturday. So we'll get into all of your long range weekend weather details coming up. Thanks, Carolyn. The Chase the Ace craze has taken over the ghouls. The wildly popular fundraiser continues to grow at St. Kevin's Parish with the estimated grand prize reaching hundreds of thousands of dollars and thousands of people are hoping they'll get a chance to go for the ace. Here and now's Andrew Sampson has been in the ghouls today and he joins us live. Andrew, just how big could the pot get tonight? Uh, hi, Jeremy. Um, things are pretty crazy here out in the Goulds. The small community just outside of St. John's has caught Chase the Ace fever, and for good reason. The jackpot pot is estimated to hit over $600,000 tonight. That's a lot of money tied up in one deck of cards. And it's helped out local businesses, too. Earlier today, I headed to Keith's Diner, located just across from the Paris Hall. Judging from the plates of fries, D and G that I saw there, business is booming.
We've never seen anything like this in our over 50 years of business. Um, every single business in the community is booming. Everybody's benefiting from it. Uh, it it's great. It's good for everybody, for sure. Um, about equivalent to what we would do on Good Friday, which is our busiest day of the year. Um, we have to have two cash registers running. As you can tell, this place is madness, but uh, no complaints. It's wonderful. We've had extra staff on since January. We love all the excitement. Uh, we buy tickets. We pool our money together. It's wonderful for the community. The big draw is tonight at 8 p.m., and Ward says that all the staff at Keys have chipped in on tickets. If she draws the chase of eight, the, the big ace tonight, she says that there's a good chance that no one will show up for work tomorrow, and the party will begin. Reporting live for the Goulds, I'm Andrew Sampson for Here and Now. Brian Peckford doesn't live in Newfoundland and Labrador anymore. Find out why he's weighing in on the debate to get answers from Muskrat Falls. The provincial government has promised some sort of in-depth look into how the Muskrat Falls project got so far behind schedule and so over budget. Now the Premier says that can't happen until after the project is done, but one former Premier is calling for a forensic audit to start right away. Brian Peckford joins me now from Vancouver Island. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. 
So why do you think that this forensic audit has to start now? I'm very concerned knowing how government operates, that if we wait until the project is done and over, there is a psychology which goes with that. Uh, that two or three years from now, the politics will be different. The whole uh, atmosphere surrounding the project will be different. And then trying to get a legitimate, accountable, a well-framed uh, forensic audit, plus quite likely a, a public inquiry, will be far more difficult. So I think the time is now for us to move on getting some idea of just what went wrong here. Now, what about the concerns that we've heard, though, from the Premier that if we do this now, this is going to distract the top officials from Nalcor from trying to keep the cost down, from trying to get it done, and so this ends up actually contributing to the problem? Well, you know, that's always going to be the argument, isn't it? That uh, we, we've got a... Uh, we can't do anything now. We've got to wait. Uh, given that the problem is so horrendous, I mean, if this was your, your normal mistake, if you will, you, uh, you, you could understand it. But in light of what the SNC-Lavalin report just came out with, it seems to me that uh, we just cannot, uh, we cannot wait. And uh, if, if these people are as good as the Premier and others say they are in doing this, then I'm sure a forensic audit where they would be just looking for documents and asking questions could be handled. I mean, suddenly multitasking is not in, um, not in vogue anymore. Uh, we're talking about billions of dollars over budget and so on. The other thing is, overriding everything, it seems to me, given what has happened, is the public's right to know. Now, you don't live in the province anymore. You're not going to have to pay the sky-high rates when Muskrat Falls is built and the power comes online. So why does this still concern you? Well, I was born a Newfoundlander. The Peckford family go back to about 1785. Uh, I was a teacher in Newfoundland. I was a politician in Newfoundland. I was a premier in Newfoundland. I'm still very concerned about my native province. Uh, I have no, uh, I have no uh, axe to grind here. I have no skin in the game. Uh, and others who are arguing not to do anything right now do have certain conflict of interest situations. So I think I'm a sort of a freelance kind of person who understands public policy, especially as it relates to Newfoundland and Labrador. And therefore, I can perhaps provide a more impartial voice now, so many years removed from it myself. I was involved in you know, trying to negotiate lower Churchill development agreements. I was involved in three hydro projects on the island when I was Minister of Energy. I've negotiated, you know, I've negotiated the Hibernian Statement of Principles, which was billions of dollars. I understand the big picture, and I also understand the smaller pressure picture that the, the Premier now finds himself in. But in weighing all of that, it seems to me uh, that the problems that have been exposed in this project demand some answers now, because now that the iron is hot, I think now is the time to look for those answers. Well, Mr. Packford, thank you very much for sharing your views on this with us. I'm very glad you called, and I'm very happy to participate in this kind of public policy discussion. No, we're not to bed. That's it. It was a life lost. A teenager drowned at a popular swimming hole in Flat Rock yesterday afternoon. A sad but common occurrence, says one resident.
Well, it's an unwanted but sadly not uncommon sight in Flat Rock. Emergency responders flocking to a popular swimming spot. Yesterday afternoon, a 16-year-old boy drowned in a big river swimming hole. It's a sight too familiar for one man who lives nearby. Ryan Cook talked to him. Last night I heard the number of sirens going. I seen the fire truck going out the main road and I knew right off the bed. I said, there's a life lost. It's, I hate just the sound of it. When, when you know what happened down this way, that you know, you know what happened and not what you could do about it. You gotta basically live with it or try to live with it. But there have been too many lives lost in this river. But uh, it's impossible to bear it off. People say, oh, could you bear it off? But you're here now, you know the, the area. It's impossible to do it. There's no way. You've got the East Coast Trail going through it. And you just hope this is the last one. But we know it's not, it's not going to be. How many instances do you know of when someone nearly died or, or did die here? I say all together. Uh, I'm thinking about six, seven, there's a couple of narrow misses, there's definitely three drownings, beside this one. Right? I know I think the last, I won't remember, there was a, he was an actor, uh, he drowned here, right? And there's a couple of other, and another young fellow drowned, he was some 16, 17. How many people come through here on a, on a hot, sunny uh, day? You won't be able to count them. But you could drive right here on a hot day and you see the main road is always blocked with cars. Right? Even the police had to come down and give out tickets because there's that many cars parked. Right? And what's, what, what is so dangerous about, about this river? The river is after any rainfall. Any river, I guess, doesn't matter where it's to in, in the province or country, it's going to be run fast. In areas, you're going to have these whirlpools and I guess kids don't realize it. And this is, makes it what every time we head around here was hours after a rainfall. Looking to some national news now. Canadian Blood Services has warned that donations are critically low heading into the summer. But one gay Toronto man is pointing out that he had to abstain from having sex for a whole year just to be eligible to give blood. And while Ottawa has reduced the abstinence period from five years to just one, many say the rules for gay men who want to donate blood are still too strict. Philippe Montieu reports. It does limit what you can do in the bedroom. This gay man from Toronto, whose identity CBC News has agreed to protect, has gone for an entire year without sex, just so he could give blood. That's the Canadian deferral period for men who have sex with men. The 28-year-old was able to give in December of last year, and again in April, while in a committed relationship. I do wish that I could both give blood and not feel like I'm missing out on something uh, with somebody I care about. The policy evolved from a complete ban to a five-year abstinence period in 2013. That was changed to one year last August. Why one year? Nobody can say exactly, except that gay and bisexual men are statistically at higher risk of contracting HIV. This infectious diseases specialist questions the whole purpose of a deferral period since all donated blood is tested rigorously. He says detecting the virus used to take three months, but now results can be conclusive almost immediately as we appreciate how good the diagnostic tests are for infections like HIV in the blood bank. And uh, we, we might see some changes in policy in the next, in the next uh, months or years to come. Some countries like Spain and Italy already got rid of their deferral period. Even though Canadian Blood Services could benefit from extra donors since its current reserve heading into the summer is at a low point, the organization says more evidence is needed. We continue to look at ways that we can reduce that time period based on research. Uh, but uh, we still have to follow all the processes that are, you know, that are in place. In the next few months, the National Blood Bank will hand out nearly $3 million in research grants. The goal is to review donor eligibility criteria and screening for men who have sex with men. And all this could mean changing Health Canada's policy once again. Philippe de Montigny, CBC News, Toronto. Now to international news. Tensions are rising in Hamburg, Germany, ahead of the G20, G20 summit, which starts on Friday. Riot police used water cannons to clear protesters off the streets late last night. Hundreds gathered on one of the city's main streets in the first major protest of the summit. 
Tens of thousands of protesters are expected to march in the city this week. German authorities have deployed some 20,000 police officers in anticipation of violence at the protests. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, U.S. President Donald Trump, and Russian President Vladimir Putin will be among the leaders attending the summit, hosted by German Chancellor Angela Merkel. Well, the U.S. has eased the ban on laptop computers in airline cabins on some direct flights into the country. Three airlines are now exempt. Officials at Turkish Airways say their passengers leaving from Istanbul are cleared to take their laptops on board. Emirates, based in Dubai, is also now exempt from the ban. Ethad Airways of Abu Dhabi was taken off the list. American officials say the airlines are complying with enhanced security measures. The weather update is brought to you by Belltone Hearing Service St. John's, helping the world hear better. Well, we're going to bring in Carolyn Stokes to mm -hmm. talk about the weather. Yes, the long range forecast. Before we get to it, uh, I just wanted to show you this lovely picture. We're on a bit of an iceberg kick right now. Only for I, like I, the last <laughs> three months. I know, it really feels that way. I like this one because of the fog that's kind of in, in the air there and uh, that, the layers. This is Jackson's arm and thank you to uh, Glennis for sending this in. Love this picture. Uh, no matter how many times you do see icebergs, they are still pretty impressive. They really are. So I'm sure we'll get a few more icebergs uh, <laughs> in the next few weeks as well. So looking at, uh, I just wanted to start actually with uh, the current temperatures because it's just so striking. This is Canada. We have 22 in Vancouver, 25 in Calgary, 29 in Winnipeg and eight in St. John. Such a dramatic difference uh, in the temperature here today. Tomorrow things are improving for sure. We have sunshine pretty much right across the whole island. Temperatures nice and warm in most places. Central looking at the mid 20s. St. John's 22, a little bit cooler in Placentia with the winds, 12 degrees there and cooler along the shores as well. Uh, in Labrador, some showers coming for uh, Lab City and Churchill Falls, about five millimeters expected tomorrow and uh, some nice weather coming uh, here along the Straits, 24 in Mary's Harbor tomorrow with some sunshine. So looking ahead, we have uh, some more showers coming for Labrador and uh, you can see the scattered little shower hitting the island, but mostly we're looking at a cloudy day on Friday, but temperatures still nice and warm in uh, the 20s on the island, but cloudy skies mostly uh, right across the island on Friday afternoon. And in Labrador, we're looking at some more showers, but again, it's still nice and warm. 22 in eastern Labrador, 18 in the west. So. This is the weekend, and this is what I was talking about earlier, the system that's coming up, going to hit the island uh, first thing on Saturday and in Labrador as well. So it looks like pretty much everyone is going to get a taste of wet weather on the weekend. We still don't know the amounts yet, but uh, you can see that it's just encompassing the whole island. Uh, by Saturday afternoon, though, things look like they might start to clear off. But during the day, we are looking largely at showers. But yet again, it is still warm. Temperatures in uh, the 20s, 19 in the east. Showers across the board in Labrador. Slightly cooler in western Labrador, 17 degrees as the high there on Saturday. So if you're looking to do an outdoor activity, Sunday is definitely your day. If you're in uh, the eastern part and central on the island, we're looking at 23 degrees and some cloud on Sunday in St. John's in the eastern part of the island, 25 in central with cloudy skies and the chance of showers there in western Newfoundland. And you can see as we begin the work week yet again, it is going to turn uh, just gorgeous once more. So temperatures nice and warm as we begin the work week. And in Labrador, you can see just lots and lots of showers, uh, but at least things are going to be warm. Sunday, we're looking at 22 degrees with some showers warming up to 26 on Monday in Happy Valley Goose Bay in the east. Uh, for western Labrador, we're looking at a bit of a cool down on Sunday. Chance of showers there, 15 as the high, 17 on Monday.
Well, today's Young Athlete of the Day is from Bay Bulls. Molly Tobin is four years old and has been dancing for three years. She loves the big stage. Molly also plays soccer during the summer months. Way to go, Molly. You are our Young Athlete of the Day. More than half a million bucks is up for grabs, but will someone win tonight? Ahead, it's back to the Goulds for Chase the Ace. Welcome back to Here and Now, and time to turn to a reporter who's likely been having the most fun out of any of the reporters today. And I'm talking, of course, about Andrew Sampson, and he's live in the Goulds tonight, where thousands of people have gathered for to chase that elusive ace. So, Andrew, there's a lot of money up for grabs tonight, and a lot of people hoping to walk away with that jackpot. Yeah, it, it has been a lot of fun out here tonight. Anticipation's building, people are everywhere, and traffic's at a standstill. We're just about an hour away from the big draw, where we'll find out if anyone will win the $600,000 plus prize this week. Earlier today, I had the opportunity to talk to some of the people in town, loading up on tickets, about what they would do if they won the money. Uh, I won't retire. I'll take the summer off. Let's see, I'll just take the summer off, that's all. Uh, first I'll buy a new car, <laughs> and then half of it I will probably give my parents, and then have a big celebration, I would say, yeah. Start the car, we're going on a trip tomorrow morning. Where are you going? Florida. I'd probably buy a new car, maybe put a down payment on a house, but after we come back from sunny south. I don't know what I would do with it, but I'm not sure we would have plans probably for a new home or something like that. The draw will take place after 8 p.m. And remember, you actually have to be in the Goulds with your ticket for your chance to win. Good luck. Reporting live for Here and Now, from the Goulds, I'm Andrew Sampson. 
More good news, this time from Broadway. Canadian theatre is having a maple leaf moment in the Big Apple. The success of Come From Away has sparked new interest in Canadian productions, and more shows are hoping to get some of that spotlight. Stephanie Van Campen has that story. What's the uh, orange? So this was, orange is, thing. those orange circles represent a cluster of activities. So those are weekends. So this is what Albert Schultz calls his wall of madness. Each tiny box represents one performance, a scheduling nightmare for his theater company's New York Festival. One month, 12 shows, five venues. To take a, a dozen shows and to take 65 artists when no one knows who they are <laughs> is uh, it's crazy. Crazy and costly. The Toronto Theatre Company is spending two and a half million on the project. Did you ever see an <laughs> We're going to have relationships that come out of this. Um, relationships with audience, relationships with colleagues, relationships with other artists. And that, that is an investment, a risk, if, if you will, that is, I think, well worth taking. But getting Canadian theatre to New York is no walk in Central Park. Only five productions written by Canadians have ever made it to Broadway. The latest Tony Award winning Come From Away. New York has always been open to theatre that comes from away, but now Canada is in the spotlight. To be thinking about Canada when you go to the theatre is unusual and it puts Canada in a really positive light. Soul Pepper hopes to capitalize on the Maple Leaf moment. Each show in their off-Broadway festival was written or adapted by a Canadian. Who calls 911? I do. Is there an Titles like Kim's Convenience, Spoon River, and Of Human Bondage. Soul Pepper hopes to build on the success it's had here. After all, as the song goes, if you can make it there, you can make it anywhere. Stephanie Van Campen, CBC News, Toronto. While well, sticking with national news, a Quebec man says his life may have changed dramatically after almost losing a hand in a workplace accident last year. But he's grateful he's still able to get behind the wheel of his cherished motorcycle. Claude Rivest has that story. David Doonan was at work last year when his hand got stuck between two heavy rollers. And I had to really pull hard because it would have took my whole arm. And finally I managed to pull the emergency cord, and, but in seconds, I mean... The hand was all skeleton. It took five operations and countless hours of physiotherapy, but his hand was saved. Basically what Dr. Trombley did is she cut me on three sides here, yeah. opened that up, put my hand inside, the bones, like, and sewed it back over. To allow it to heal? Yeah, and my hand stayed there three weeks. It left his hand looking like a mitten. Only recently was his index finger separated from the rest of the hand. But despite his injuries, one of Dunan's first thoughts was for his bike. He thought he would never ride again. He took me out of the, the, the shop and the, and the stretcher. I remember pointing to the ambulance guy and telling him, look, that's my new bike. You know, want a bike? It's going to be for sale soon. You know? He never did sell it. Instead, Dunan went to a local motorcycle expert for help. Pierre Boulac is a pro at turning bikes like this into this. Since David could not operate a front brake with his hand, uh, we uh, figured out a way to just give him proper uh, front brake operation with what was available. It's not even that high tech. Here is the hose that lengthened, brought to the rear master cylinder, involves brake pedal. So along with the rear hose, we connected it to go to the front caliper. Meaning the brakes that were on his handles are now activated by the foot pedal. The accident has brought the two men closer. They're now good friends and others have also helped Dunan move forward. Great people like the nurses, the, the, the anesthesiologists. You meet all these people and they change your life. I mean, Dr. Trump really changed my life. He may have lost the full use of his hand, but Dunan says he's gained a new outlook on life. Claude Rivet, CBC News, West Brom. The military is suspending five of its members who caused a scene on Canada Day. The servicemen, who call themselves the Proud Boys, disrupted an Indigenous rally in Halifax. The chief of defence staff says the men are also being placed under investigation. He added that their military careers are also in doubt. A video of the incident shows five men interacting with spectators at the ceremony. 
Well, an emergency meeting of First Nations chiefs is taking place at a Thunder Bay, Ontario high school. It's over the safety of Indigenous students. It's important thing is keeping our kids safe and healthy, keeping that education at the forefront. Well, between the years 2000 and 2011, seven young Indigenous students died while attending boarding schools in the city. Six of them went to the same school. The two-day emergency meeting also follows the death of two Indigenous teens in May. Their bodies were pulled from the city's waterways. Well, it was a busy day for the Prime Minister during the Scottish leg of his current European road trip. Justin Trudeau had a private audience with Queen Elizabeth in today in Edinburgh. It all happened at her official residence in Scotland. Trudeau presented her with the flag which flew from the Peace Tower during July 1st celebrations. Earlier in the day, Trudeau received an honorary degree from the University of Edinburgh. Well, ancient history meets modern technology innovation in Lima, Peru. Scientists have reconstructed the face of the mummified lady of cow using a 3D printer. The woman lived in northern Peru more than 1,500 years ago, but technology and forensic sleuthing means we now have an idea of what she would have looked like. She was buried with a crown and her body was tattooed with serpents and spiders. Some believe she was a priestess or maybe even a ruler. Splashing around for the camera, five killer whales put on a spectacular show for a drone in Vancouver's Horseshoe Bay. The drone's owner spotted a dark fin cresting the water about 15 meters from the shore on Sunday. While he got his drone in the air just in time to capture these stunning images, it's not uncommon to see killer whales in the area, but it is unusual for them to come so close to shore. Very majestic creatures there. Absolutely, when they're not hunting and eating salmon. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Great video. Welcome back to Here and Now. Can your garbage bin bear up to a bear attack? No, oh, that one didn't. These eight grizzlies have a job. Companies can bring their products to a special area of Yellowstone National Park and if the containers, to see if those containers can pass a 60-minute bear test. 
then they can be sold as bear resistant. Now, it's not just fun for the bears that get to eat whatever's inside, it's also fun for the spectators, and it benefits the bears because keeping food waste away from animals is a great way of keeping them away from people. Like daughter, like father. This, uh, this dad went viral about 15 months ago, uh, spoofing his daughter's selfies. Since then, he's kept that trend going one hilariously <laughs> <laughs> pose at a time. That's the thing about dad jokes. They tend to go on a lot longer than you'd expect. Dad jokes, something I'd know all about. <laughs> I can hardly bear these pictures that are showing up here. <laughs> I wonder what she <laughs> thinks about it. Who does it. it better? That's really oh, the... Oh, look at those eyebrows. His eyebrow, his wow. contour game is on point. On fleek, as the kids <laughs> say. <laughs> Stop trying to make fleek happen. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, I don't think you need to be a dad to make dad jokes. Anyone can make a dad joke. Jonathan Crow was famous for it, I recall. <laughs> <laughs> True, <laughs> yes, that's a very good point. Anywho, uh, looking at uh, the next three days, uh, basically for the island, we're looking at sunshine, warm temperatures, then cloudy skies on Friday, and then some showers on Saturday. But temperatures in the uh, low to mid-20s on the island, Labrador is looking at uh, showers pretty much across the board uh, for the next three days. Tomorrow in Happy Valley, Goose Bay, 25 as the high, and on Saturday, looking at uh, 19 degrees as the high with some showers in the eastern region and 17 in the west. So I thought I'd end with this beautiful uh, weather picture of the day. I think it's a sunset, but I just love the colors and it looks nice and warm. And I'm in the mood to think warm thoughts. It's good. It's not an iceberg. <laughs> it's perfect. It's, yes. it's very pretty. It's very yeah. pretty. That's Wings Point in uh, Gander Bay. So thank you to uh, Cavell. Cavell Snow? Cavell yep. Snow, yeah. Yeah, for sending that in. Now, in case you're wondering why it's me, Peter, and Carolyn, that's because there are a few meetings that the, the regulars here mm -hmm. are attending. So guess what? We get to do it all again tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So boys of summer and Carolyn Stokes <laughs> giving us back. the weather. We'll be uh, back again tomorrow. So uh, did, Now, did any of you give uh, Andrew any money for the Chase the Ace? Uh, oh, <laughs> I might idea, have a few, uh, few cards up my sleeve. Uh, we'll see how it goes. <laughs> if you won, you probably might not be joining us tomorrow night. That would... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I might not be feeling too well. Have a good night, everyone. Thanks Goodbye. for joining us. Good night.